Um, you may have noticed that we're in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, if you watched the news at all in the last week, coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, it's deeply anxiety-inducing, of course, and empty supermarket shelves indicate just how much people are concerned, uh, and we can all understand why. Um, there is something about the virus, though, that's very revealing, and the nature and how and where it is spreading um, and its health, social, and psychological impacts tell us something about the world we live in, our lives, and our relationship to big systems of power, money, technology, and ecology. And this is the core of what I wish to discuss today. What is the relationship between our lives, and um, what I would call the life world, and big systems? that, depending on our relationship with them, can aid and support quality of life or can be destructive of it. I want to make three core arguments. Firstly, um, increasingly the institutions that are designed to help us make the most of systems and buff buffer us from their negative impacts are faltering. There is a loss of trust. These institutions can be civic, such as church, trade union, community, or political, uh, representative democracy, international organization, communities of action, or legal, regulatory, or service-based, um, such as the welfare state. I mean, and this dense layer of institutions designed to support us and help us um, intersect with the world of big systems is weakened, and we have failed to replenish it adequately. The second argument I wish to make is that the, these big systems of power, money, technology, and ecology are intruding deeper and deeper into the life world. And it should be the opposite. The values of the life world and its convivial human characteristics should intrude deeper and deeper into big systems. And finally, to resolve these challenges, to reform and cultivate new legitimate institutions requires a dialogue between highly divergent value sets in our society that are in deep conflict. These are values of tradition and authority, liberal values of reason and universality and post-liberal perspectives on the dignity of particular groups and on a concern at unequal status. All these values have something to say. They are just seemingly incapable of entering into purposeful dialogue, and so we fail to act with any degree of consensus and legitimacy. So how is coronavirus relevant here, where I started out? I've just touched my face, I noticed. Is everyone really self-conscious now whenever they touch their face? Don't count how many times I do it, please. Um, but how is coronavirus relevant here? It, it, it shines a light on the nature of our relationship with these big systems. Firstly, um, it reminds us that we are part of nature. Remember, the contention of the Enlightenment was that there was something called civilization and something called a state of nature. It reminds us, reminds us that we are part of an interconnected whole. We impact ecology and it constrains us. This is very important when thinking about climate change and it's a thought I'll return to. Um, incidentally, it seems that coronavirus was transferred from, from bats in Wuhan, rather than not just um, unsanitary conditions in the local market, which is um, interesting. There is an umbilical cord between us and the rest of ecology. Coronavirus also says something about the system of power. Different societies respond in radically different ways. The Chinese seem to have limited the spread of coronavirus quite spectacularly, actually. Um, they've done so by taking quite draconian measures. For example, the mobile payment service Alipay, uh, it's a private um, payment service, a bit like sort of Apple Pay or so on, has cooperated with the Chinese government um, to flag those at risk of having already contracted the virus. You might turn up to board a train at a station, and because of your spending habits, where you've been, who you've interacted with, and what you've been searching for online, you might be flagged as a red risk and told to go home. It seems to have worked in stemming the increase. And by the way, CO2 emissions have gone down um, as well. That this is possible reveals something about Chinese power and its ability to direct its populace. Would we be comfortable with such incursions on freedom and privacy? We may be about to find out how power really works um, in our society. Money and the system of money will determine how resilient you're able to be 
in the face of coronavirus. Of course, your age and medical condition will matter. Uh, another reminder of the underlying reality of biology and ecology. But whether you are treated or not um, will depend on access to money in some societies. If you are a vulnerable worker on low income or work in a firm that goes bust um, because it can't function amidst, amidst cash flow pressures um, of downing tools or flights, and then you're exposed to more risk. The system of money is unevenly distributed um, and redistributed um, um, welfare state at systems only provides some rather than complete cover. Your life will depend on your access to money in the money system. And technology may save the day, the system of technology. We may come up with a new vaccine within months. And um, equally, from the Chinese examples, it could lead to some very direct management of our lives. Coronavirus today, and who knows what behaviours may be managed um, in the future. By the way, Korea is starting to do the same thing as well. It's insisting that you download an app that manages your life if you've been isolated, having been at risk at, uh, of or having contracted coronavirus. Institutions matter in determining both what corporations and governments may be able to do in, in managing our lives. Technology can spread fear and panic in the face of social media means fear and anxiety. We may turn on particular groups primed by these social media means. And I've already seen one or two really ugly things expressed about the Chinese um, online. How quickly we turn on one another. How we interface with technology, how it relates to our lives matters. That interface depends on good institutions that support good behavior, knowledge, development, gathering, that we manage and respond to bad behavior, and we can ensure that people are protected and supported. So coronavirus, a deadly virus, is shining a very clear light. How we protect and enhance our life world depends on the right institutions through which we relate to money, power, technology, and ecology, and the values contained within these institutions. And that is the public dialogue we sorely need. Now, a century ago, the industrialising world was in the foothills of a remarkable revolution in institutional creativity. Um, this would not have been apparent in the aftermath of the First World War, and its institutional spring almost became a winter in the shadow of the Great Depression and the disastrous consequences that sprang from that. But by the late 1950s, most of the institutional architecture on which we now rest, international, economic, state and cultural, was largely in place. In recent decades, however, decay has set in. Why? Now, institutions exist to pursue and safeguard a common purpose. That's their fundamental reason for being. They embed values such as fairness, freedom, and the rule of law in ordered human relations. Institutions safeguard values and seek equity. They're ethical um, in character. Um, and by contrast, what we call organizations, they tend to pursue goals that are more private in character. Institutions pursue some sort of ethical public good. Um, institutions are also organizations, but that lies in a bit of a tension. But let's take the NHS for an example. The NHS has high reserves of public legitimacy, which, by the way, are going to be really important over the coming months, um, as it protects our health and is available to all citizens. Um, it has become a source of national pride. And so when institutions like the NHS combine efficiency of outcomes, they perform well, they protect our health, they combine equity of values, they embody a sense of fairness and justice, everybody gets access um, to the NHS, and a sense of emotional commitment is part of who we are, that we feel a sense of pride um, in the NHS. When they have these elements together, they flourish. When any of these elements decay, they fail. So, my intention today is not to provide a blueprint for change. I'm more interested in sharing some thoughts on how we might map out the terrain going forward. There are some limited ideas that I have a ways forward, but the terrain I map out is too complex and too contingent to be managed through blueprints. And actually, more importantly, I just don't have the answers um, because it doesn't depend on me. It depends on us. How are we going to move forward to navigate a train that is quite rough and imposing? At the end, I'll lay out some, some, uh, at the end of laying out some thoughts, I'll be inviting you to reflect, um, as was discussed earlier, on what, what I've um, put before you. 
to see what I've missed and challenge some of the things that I've said um, by all means. But I'd like you to have those conversations amongst yourselves and I'd love to hear from a range of voices, including many who don't normally speak at these sorts of events. So it's good to have a whole range of voices. And I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. But there's two questions that I'm going to explore. Firstly, how can we get to a deeper understanding of the ways in which our interaction with the four big systems of money, power, technology, and ecology both enhance and limit us? And the second question, how can we seek to expand our life world into these systems in a way that allows us to safeguard what is human and precious? Can they make us rather than break us? In a time of political anxiety and uncertainty, of ecological threat and breakdown, of bewilderment at the promise and risk of new technologies, at a time of enormous inequalities of wealth and opportunity and economic insecurity, how can we even begin to embark on a mission of institutional creativity? The type that was embarked upon by Europe and North America from the late 19th century to at least the middle of the 20th century. How do we navigate the systems of this time amidst deep conflict at the level of our values? How do we enhance our life world and our life places? Where we are and where we're committed to is important. Our locality and our planet, can, how can they be enhanced in this process? And currently this sense of institutional decay, that this loss of a combination of efficiency, equity, and emotional connections with these critical institutions is often more visible than institutional creativity. Now, Arguably, one of the emblematic creations of the institutional revolution was the European Union. Or so it became in 1993, following four decades of evolution, obviously started out as a European coal and steel community, and then became a European economic community, and finally the European Union. It was established to help solder a fractured European continent, and it has two fundamental functions, peace and prosperity. Its values can be found in its key document. It, it aims to achieve peace and prosperity through strengthening democracy and the rule of law. The EU has been deemed so successful in achieving these goals that it was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in 2012. Yet, when the prize was awarded, it felt incongruous to many, coming as it did in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the European debt crisis, particularly if you're Greece, Italy, Portugal, even Ireland. And now the UK, one of the bloc's three biggest members, has left the Union. And while Brexit has seemed to bolster support for the EU outside of the UK, this is based on fear of undergoing the exit process rather than a positive affirmation for membership of the European Union. Gaps have emerged between the European Union's values as expressed and its values as experienced. In 2004, 28% of the EU population over the age of 15 did not trust the EU. This had grown to 39% by 2018. Opposition to further integration has soared, despite the ambition of ever closer union embodied in the EU treaties, despite a healthy majority of Europeans, including ironically in Britain, seeing the benefits of membership, according to Eurobarometer. From the left, the critique of the European Union is one of a superficial commitment to solidarity, especially in the aftermath of the Eurozone crisis. On the right, the critique is one of a commitment to international solidarity that is too great, particularly when it has come to multiculturalism and the movement of people. Both the left and right point to a democratic deficit. The realities of Brexit may have caused a pause of thought amongst the EU's populace on how far to push anti-EU sentiment, but this may well turn out to be a temporary deceleration in the context of wider institutional decay. So we're seeing, going back to those themes of efficiency, equity, and emotional commitment, we're seeing a misalignment in the case of the EU. And the EU has few democratically, um, authentically democratic tools in terms of direct public engagement to respond. So it's become quite technical less about values and emotional commitment. And there's similar dysfunction at national level, not least within the UK, where successive governments have pursued sort of national growth as a primary goal. This has meant focusing on industries and sectors that have the greatest growth potential and prioritizing their needs. And the global leaders in such sectors, which include finance, pharmaceuticals, digital technology, are often clustered in or near London. Now, until the austerity years, regions that were losing out were partly compensated through redistribution. This is now broken down completely. 
A blinker pers Whitehall perspective on efficiency, including the ugly process of centralized austerity, has concentrated power and resources and overridden um, concerns for equity. Discontent in the UK's nations and regions furthest from the capital have proliferated, not least in Scotland, increasingly in Northern Ireland and Wales. Populism and natu nationalism have become more widespread, fragmenting the country politically across geographical lines. The same is true of the EU and, of course, the US in the age of Trump. So we're seeing this decay of trust in institutions of democracy, of government, of collective provision. Um, and they're increasingly challenged. And we're seeing an end of that sort of, que the, uh, of a sort of que consensus that emerged from the last long period of institutional creativity. Over time, the institutions of the last industrial, uh, institutional revolution, such as universal representative democracy, international cooperation, collective welfare provision, and the mechanisms of managing and regulating the market have experienced declining commitment. A new systemic experience, not least in the areas of technology and ecology, which I'll come back to, have not yet experienced intense institutional development. After decades of the last institutional revolution, the social theorist Herbert Marcuse became deeply concerned about the absence of critique within advanced industrial society. Writing in the 1960s, he described the modern sensibility as that of one-dimensional man. It's always men in those days. He outlined how a modern consumerist economy facilitated through industrial technology, mass media, politics, and corporate culture had combined to create an insipid consensus. People bought into consumerist capitalism, they like their washing machines, and became inhibited, unable, and unconsciously willing to challenge the structural powering inequalities, um, undermining what he saw um, as real human freedom. Now, the consensus that Marcuse described has broken down. Our world is increasingly dominated by digital technologies and operates very differently than it did at the time that Marcuse was writing. In the age of Cambridge Analytica and online extremism, we now know that our darkest psychological recesses can be plundered and mobilized to confuse, disorient, misinform, and deploy us against one another. No longer one-dimensional, we are now increasingly tribal and angry. Brexit was one of the most spectacular deployments of real discontent as efficiency and equity in institutions became misaligned. The take back control slogan of vote leave deployed PSYOP, psychological operations, psychological and emotive hyper-targeting to great success, regardless of the merit of the case or otherwise. In the 1960s, Marcuse feared the obsolescence of critique due to the intersection of capitalism, politics and culture. Today, we face the opposite threat pervasive critique, and a shattering consensus. So this unravelling of faith in common institutions has emerged just as we face extraordinary collective challenges. As the entrepreneur and analyst Azim Azhar has described, there is now an exponential gap between accelerating new technologies on one hand and the institution's ability to respond. As we've seen with Brexit, this is compounded by a democratic deficit as polarization leads to a fraying of faith in political institutions. In the shadow of climate emergency, we are also facing an existential gap. Action on climate change, the necessity of which has been scientifically clear since at least the 1980s, has been slovenly, to say the least. The International Panel on Climate Change is already in its sixth assessment cycle. The Kyoto Protocol was signed a generation ago. Nonetheless, global carbon emissions are still rising. Even to keep global temperature rises to one and a half um, Celsius requires a 55% reduction in greenhouse emissions by 2030. Such a temperature rise would still cause enormous ecological disaster and result in a mass movement to people. The institutional response to climate change, including the creation of the IPCC itself, has been real. Unfortunately, we've been fighting with two hands, equity and emotion, the hands of equity and emotion, behind our backs. Some, including the American writer David Wallace Wells, has suggested that the climate crisis is so urgent that the business as usual, including the reliance on representative democracy, might have to be deprioritized. Yet, 
Institutions thrive when they align efficiency goals, such as emissions targets, with values, such as commitment to universal welfare of humanity and the wider ecology, and emotion, such as a sense of profound, deep psychological loss through a failure to protect the sanctity of humankind's home. To succeed, international and institutional responses must safeguard existing values, not just show themselves to be efficient. This includes the belief that public policy should be accountable to the people. Without the democratic process, shifts of policy that require enormous resources can never have legitimacy. And that is why the emergence of Extinction Rebellion movement has been so encouraging. It helps facilitate a fertile ground to connect rationality to values and emotion. Its manifesto, tell the truth, efficiency. Take action, emotional drive, and deliberate equity and values offers a powerful rebuff to complacency um, and action without values in the field of climate change. And as I mentioned earlier, Enlightenment philosophers are very fond of speculating on the condition of man in a state of nature, nature men again. Um, if you consider that way of thinking for a moment, it actually, actually separates humans from nature. The basic construct is this, is this notion of prehistory, where there was a humanity as part of nature and civilization where humans and nature are separate entities. This thinking is unraveling, the more we find out about ourselves. From our core DNA, to our microbiome, to our diet and lifestyles, to our exposure, to global pandemics, to our lives being inextricably linked with global nature as part of it rather than separate to it. Without a fundamental reassessment um, on, on the line of, of continuity between ecology and ourselves, we court disaster. The story of a failure to decarbonize is just a warning shot. When science, expertise, and rationality are in the driving seat, we often struggle to find lasting solutions or solutions that operate with enough urgency. A climate transformation without democratic legitimacy and social justice at its core will likely fail and time is short. The same level of challenge emerges from our evolving relationship with the system of technology. As radical technologies spread into public services, including health, and into the workplace, this lesson will become ever more pertinent. The academic and innovation communities surrounding the introduction of these technologies, such as AI and machine learning, are acutely aware of the need to put them on an ethical footing. For instance, trade unions in Denmark are seeking to understand how new technologies can benefit workers. Healthcare providers, including the NHS, are seeking to understand how AI can improve care, grounded in ethical codes. And academics are developing um, frameworks and practice to embed ethical application of technology in arenas such as public order and safety. Technologies such as genetic screening and CRISPR gene editing raise fundamental issues of access and power. What will be sanctioned? On what basis? Who has access? A Chinese scientist, He Jiang has already claimed to have edited the genome embryos of two girls born in 2018. How can we protect the rights of the not yet born? What new inequalities will emerge if technology to manipulate genes that influence our cognitive capability, our physical strength, well-being and personalities becomes feasible and affordable? What data do we want to share? And for what benefit in a world where our potential future health can be known through our genetic makeup? What will this mean for us psychologically and for equality and fairness in society? All these questions are critically questions of power. It is far from clear that we have the institutional capacity to respond with legitimacy. Humanity could be separated into those who have access and agency with regards to critical technologies and those who do not. The worst of both worlds could be access to that agency. If we access systems that manage our behavior through monitoring, nudging, and other forms of behavioral manipulation, then we are faced with a substantive loss of freedom, no matter how happy we may be on the surface. So polarization could take place in public spaces, determine has who has control of technology and its inherent biases. Think about the Alipay system in China and what happened there, and think about how that could be redeployed. Will all have their rights protected, or will some be observed and targeted more? And on what basis? How will we know? How will we check? It could occur in workplaces. Access to control of AI and algorithms could be a new class divide. Who will monitor, and who will be monitored? 
within services the divide could open? Who has access to the resources, knowledge and technologies that enhance health, education, wealth and access to network networks of power and influence? Polarization could play out in politics as behavioral technologies, targeting on our own individual cognitive frailties, turn us against one another, possibly cocooning the wealthy and powerful in the process. And polarization could be coded into the social contract. Perceived good behavior defined in a manipulative, ma manipulative political space will be rewarded, and perceived bad behavior will be micromanaged beyond the point of coercion. For example, Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur into Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, has highlighted a harsh regime of welfare conditionality and the universal credit and disability payment uh, benefits that is backed by algorithmic systems with no transparency or accountability. Decisions about you and your condition and your needs are made by AI systems and no one knows how, why, or what that means. So from targeting resources to on crime to sentencing, new technologies already contain biases that disadvantage minority groups. Each of these challenges, and they're enormous, requires more than efficient pursuit of utilitarian ends. Ethical bolt-ons, where norms are devised to deal with new technologies, are also insufficient. A bolder impulse of institutional creativity is imperative, something akin to Teddy Roosevelt's vision of a square deal society. The incredible aspect of the institutional revolution of the early to mid 20th century was the fusion of goals such as health, growth, economic security, with values such as universalism, fairness, and solidarity, all bolstered, bolstered by emotional connection with the people. Modern institutional innovation is thin and slow by comparison even with its technical problem-solving approach. In an age of technology, technocracy is not enough. But we're seeing a sort of bolt-on solutionism, a sticky plaster approach for a lot of these challenges. Last year, for example, the US Business Roundtable, which comprises the CEOs of all leading American companies, from Walmart to Amazon, um, redefine the purpose of the corporation as serving an array of stakeholders, including workers and communities, rather than shareholders alone. Major corporations have a clear sense of unstable legitimacy. They're feeling a sense of being threatened and organizational existentialism. Taken at face value, corporations are accepting that the age of shareholder primacy and even shared value, where you seek to exploit environmentalism and social justice to create wealth, are moving to the past. In reality, the commitment is weak, not because it is in, insincere necessarily, but because it expresses this new bolt-on solutionism, albeit with wider goals and shareholder value. The corporations still hold control, although this new stakeholder initiative could mean that power is exercised more benevolently. So in this sort of solutionist approach, the state and corporations have much in common. States act like states, setting administrative goals and turning efficiency towards them. Uh, as Max Weber described, this is where the iron cage of democracy, a bureaucracy takes over. And corporations act in much a similar way. The modern state and modern corporations think in much more solutionist ways. But what is missing in all this process is something essential, and that's democracy. When facing sort of rational efficiency, people are too often left in terms of what the German economist Albert Hirschman uh, has described with two options, exit or loyalty. Exit occurs when trust breaks down. In the case of state, states, this involves citizens not engaging with the state services or not voting or opting in or opting for more anti-establishment parties. With corporations, they lose business and access to the best employees. But in a democratic society, a third response to failure is critical, and that is voice. And as modern states and corporations seek to respond to the gulfs that have emerged between themselves and people, they seem incapable or unwilling to truly open up to greater voice. Business and government have become problem-solving centric, each offering solutions of different types. But what are values and passion? For that, we need not simply a redefinition of goals or stakeholders, but an opening, an injection of what the German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, called communicative action. In other words, a sense that we have an ethical voice and deep attachment to the social institutions we nurture. So Habermas was concerned with the increasing invasion or colonization, as he described it, um, of the life world by the instrumental rationality of the system. The system for Habermas had two elements, power as derived by administrative authority, the domain of the state, and money 
as derived from the market and organizations that populate the market. In the modern environment, we should also see technology and the organization of ecology through energy and food systems as distinct, though overlapping, elements of this wider system. Coming back to the life world, this is where human interaction is sacrosanct. The life world is where families, community, friendship, creativity, civic life, art, culture, and perhaps one should add where the personal relationship to nature and the environment are to be found. It's a place of ethics, human connection and meaning. It is defined at its best by conviviality rather than instrumentality. This interface between the life world and the system lies right at the fault line of the failure of institutions. The life world becomes encroached upon rather than aided by the system of money, power and technology. The critical challenge becomes one of how we can enjoy a relationship with the big systems in a way that expands the values of the life world into them rather than vice versa. How can economic agency and power be more shared? How can we protect our cognitive frailties from manipulation through new technologies? How can we enjoy democratic systems that are open, that open out real choices through deliberation and transparency, rather than the battle being about who can whip up greater angry intensity in elections, referendums, um, on media and through social media? Whether through lack of investment, uh, lack of empowerment at work for too many, or through smart devices and no even deeper intrusion into our lives, or in facing the amplifying consequences of climate change, an array of institutions need to find new means of alignment with our goals, values, and passions. This applies to international institutions as much as it does to public services. The system spreads further and further into the life world. It should be the opposite. We should be expanding the humanistic life world further into the system. So the challenges here are about protecting the life world and advancing its values in the system of money, power and technology. But in the case of ecology, the challenge actually is the opposite one. How do we protect the biosphere and all that's contained within that from our life worlds? In this sphere, ecology, this system, the question is one of pulling humanity back and that requires a democratic mission like no other. When it comes to money, power and technology, the majority need more protection. When it comes to ecology, the system needs more protection from us. And let's be honest, we arrive in the 2020s without much encouragement from the 2010s. A main reason is that we're divided. But division isn't effective. We have a win-lose form of democracy with value sets in competition rather than in dialogue. How can we explore a common future where the big systems work with, not against, our life worlds? We need leadership to bring different value sets together. Leadership that integrates where possible and divides only where necessary. Three value sets are particularly prevalent in modern society, and let's call them blue, orange, and green. Blues tend to value order, authority, rules, and moral codes. These are traditionalists. They safeguard things that are of value to us. Oranges are the globalists, valuing evidence, abstract truth, universal ethics, and expertise. These are the liberals. In our modern society, these things are all things we hold dear. Greens are the egalitarians. They value diversity and inclusivity, multiculturalists to their core. These are the postmoderns, deeply critical of the failures of liberalism from racism and colonialism to environmental degradation. There's important critique in there. So all these value sets have something to offer. Can we bring them together? With these divided value sets in mind, what are the blockages to change? And what could be bridges between the different perspectives? And I'll end up on a few thoughts with that regard. So with technology, the thing that blocks change is our need for social validation. The dopamine rush of the retweet or the like, and our deficient technical understanding of how the platforms we use actually operate. A bridge could be a greater set of data rights and institutions that protect the use of our personal information for public good, including our health, um, and uh, ensures that the financial benefit derived from our data and online beh behavior is shared, whereas at the moment it's privatized in large corporations in Silicon Valley. In a system of power, a block to change is our will to power over others, our determination to have our own way, leading to escalation of political conflict and a decline of mutual respect and understanding, and I think we've seen that quite prevalent. 
But a bridge could be a more, more deliberative spaces where citizens with a variety of value sets can come together to explore evidence, test what they have in common, and come to considered and powerful conclusions. It was this method, by the way, that has enabled Ireland to move on gay marriage and abortion rights through consensus, not through fighting it out. And in the money system, a block is a day-to-day -day need to, to subsist, which diverts us often from our life world in and of itself, and the wider desire to enhance and protect our social status through the acquisition of wealth. Bridges could be, uh, in terms of protecting our life worlds, could be making space for greater voice in the workplace, more shared ownership and wealth, and even a universal basic income that gives people more power over their time and more space to make good decisions for their families and themselves. Power, money, and technology could come together in protecting ecology from us. Space to, re to reflect, to be involved in decisions, a more equitable economy, a more involved democracy, matched with mass adoption of carbon eliminating technology and a social transition, including skills and good work, unnecessary conditions for a more ecologically harmonious path. A better version of our relationship with power, money, and technology could itself be the br bridge in protecting, ecolo uh, protecting ecology from us, and in return safeguarding our life worlds. Just ask the residents of Fairbourne in Wales, who are forecast to become the UK's first climate refugee community as a result of coastal erosion. We need to act and do things differently. The blocker is we just carry on living our life world as usual, all its consequences for ecology. Fundamentally, an institutional restoration, a redesign on universal ethical and humanistic lines, and transformation on the scale of the early to mid 20th century and its square deals become necessary to counter current and potential ill effects of the systems that make and break us and the, and the ecology system that we are breaking. The process is the next great democratic step. The consequence of not responding with vigor is that we are risking further alienation, anger, disillusion, and the collapse of the viable natural system on which stable human and other life depends. The challenge is not just to pause the current institutional unraveling or its reverse. Instead, we must seek to bring about a second creative explosion and a new institutional landscape, one that reunites our sense of what is efficient, what is equitable, and what also harnesses our emotional commitment. If a politics of meaningful democracy cannot be cultivated, we are left with a reactionary politics of divided identities, abstract blueprints, impulsive populism, and ethically thin ideologies. That may be where we currently are. There is a bigger humanistic project that could be within reach. We should reach out. Thank you. <laughs>